right, Beck Sherman here. Today we're going to talk with Dr. Jason Horolak about faecal microbiota transplants, otherwise known as FMTs. Very interesting topic. Let's go and find out. So Jason, you have a, a clinic here in Hobart. Um, tell us a bit more about that. Yeah, so I, I lecture in a couple of different areas. So University of Tasmania, I coordinate their evidence-based complementary medicine programs, which were essentially designed to teach healthcare practitioners who are already out there practicing how to use natural medicines in an evidence-based and safe manner. Um, at, at the University of Western States, I wear a bit of a different cap, which is mm. where I teach, uh, again, health professionals about gut health and, and how to treat um, gastrointestinal conditions with our whole medicines, probiotics, prebiotics, and dietary and lifestyle changes. And that's probably my main, main passion. So you're a clinician here in Tasmania? Yes, yes. So I, I'm a naturopathic physician and I've been a clinician for, for 20 years essentially. I, I finished my training in 1999. I went on to do my honours and then PhD, but then I continued seeing patients throughout that entire process and, and, and now two days of my week are dedicated to, to patient days. Um, and I specialise in treating gastrointestinal conditions because that's where my background research was. Um, and these days it's really a lot around microbiota manipulation and I'm seeing patients from very few locals these days mostly national and international patients. So Jason, tell me more about what a faecal microbiota transplant, an FMT, is. Yeah, so they are gaining in, in awareness, yes. I would say, because you can go back, and the first FMTs were actually done 1,700 years ago in China, believe it or not, to treat gut and other sort of uh, even neurological conditions. So that they have been done for a fair bit of time, but probably from a Western medical perspective, I think it was 1950s that they first did their, their clinical trials or case studies on people with particular gut conditions, um, essentially caused by an overgrowth of a certain bacteria called, at that point, Clostridium difficile. It's now been renamed Clostridioides difficile, but it can cause quite dramatic um, infections in the gut and a lot of damage. And it, they've only really become common post-antibiotics because before antibiotics, this species was in only tiny amounts in our guts. It's just when we take antibiotics, a few different varieties, we can essentially create an ecological vacuum and the species tolerates the antibiotics fine and can grow into that space and then can produce toxins which can, can very much damage, damage the gut. And they can be very hard to kill with antibiotics. So m most of the research around FMT um, has been around C. diff, but that has and, and proven to be very effective, I think 80 to 90 percent cure rate for recurrent clostridium difficile infection, which is huge given antibiotics are around a 20 to 30 percent um, effective rate. So a vast improvement. Uh, but because of the research that's happened probably the last 15 years, we're, we're connecting that the gut is not just related to gut conditions, but to a lot of other things. And the gut microbiome is related to how your brain functions and your overall levels of inflammation, um, your metabolic function, capacity to gain weight, blood sugar control. All those things are regulated, at least in part, by your microbiome. Has led researchers to postulate that by changing this, we can actually change all those other conditions too. And I think this is the more exciting edge of FMTs is the fact that we're going to be using them for a wide range of disease treatments, conditions in moving into the future. Conditions like ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease. Um, some studies in irritable bowel syndrome with good results as well, but I think it's, it's working on obesity, type 2 diabetes, you know, blood sugar control, um, that, that there's some exciting results coming out. Mm -hmm. Not always positive, I must point out too, particularly with obesity aspects, and I think that we're still in the early days of matching donor to recipients really well and defining what the ideal ecosystem is to pass on to, in different disease states as well as potentially in different people. So it's, it's, it's a new science, but I think it's an area that is really, really growing. And it, just in the last couple of years, there's been some positive research both in animal models as well as in human studies in conditions like autism, in multiple sclerosis and even Alzheimer's disease. In fact, there was one, one study I recently read, and it was essentially it was a, a case report. So they had a patient who had clostridium difficile infection, and he also had Alzheimer's. And he had had Alzheimer's for a long time, and he had lost a lot of cognitive capacity, but he had this infection. So they gave him this fecal transplant to treat this infection. It worked. That was great. But what was interesting is that his partner noted that his cognitive capacity improved, and it was improving and improving dramatically for the next 6 to 12 months after the FMT. In fact, they did the, the usual scoring that they do for Alzheimer's patients. He no longer had any cognitive decline 12 months after the FMT. 
Could this be used with anxiety and depression, the FMTs? I, I would say yes, and, and I'd also say around just all, tools that can, we can use to alter the, the microbiome more broadly as well. So, so prebiotics, probiotics, dietary change definitely can have the capacity to, to shift that ecosystem dramatically, um, as can FMTs obviously, and that can actually change mood. And there was some fascinating research, I think it was 2016, where they had some, some mice and they got some you know, essentially depressed people's poo, <laughs> gave it to these mice and these mice would develop depression. You know, and it's just like, it really blows your mind when you think about it, because they're not changing any, anything else. Their diet's the same, lifestyle's the same. The only thing they're doing is getting poo from depressed people. And before you think maybe they're just not happy getting people's poo, which is a fair point, they also had a control group that actually got poo from healthy people, and they didn't get depressed. It was essentially something unique about that de depressed people's eco ecosystem that caused that um, depressed-like behavior in these mice and rats afterwards. And that, and that really showed clearly how much of a factor it can actually be in people's health. And there's been a, you know, a number of studies coming out post that time looking at primarily around how we can modify that with diet, prebiotics, and specific types of probiotics called psychobiotics, where there are probiotics that are selected because of their capacity to alter brain chemistry or actually impact mood. How is, or how are FMTs actually made? Like, how, what's the process? Different locations that do them do it a little bit differently, but. In essence, it's collecting samples of poo from people that meet their, their criteria, and then generally they're frozen at the very minimum. Like some of them will process a little bit first before the freezing process, so they can um, survive a wee bit better. And from there, the, the different places do different things. Some people, some places just will keep it frozen, then they will essentially, at the time of the transplant, and that brings up probably another, another point that's wor worth making too, is that there's two different ways of doing FMTs, broadly speaking. One is orally, two is interrectally. And interrectally can be via a colonoscopy where you're in a hospital setting uh, or you know, an academic institution where they're you know, using a colonoscope to go all the way deep inside and then release the fecal material that way. Um, then often other places are using enema kits, um, whether with, with initially often at a center, then sometimes at home afterwards. And then the, the other option is what people often will call crapsules capsules full of crap, uh, which can actually be given orally um, as well, which takes away some of the um, interaction with poo that, and interact with that some people are more um, hesitant to do. Truly in 15, 20 years, it is gonna be what we're doing for every patient is to get a background of the health of, let's check your microbiome and let's see how healthy you are. And, and I envision that, that the people talking about this now, but having toilets that can actually analyze it so you can actually get an instant readout from your toilet when you do a poo going, ah, oh, what's your ecosystem looking like? How people can start to store their feces if they're going to go in or have a round of antibiotics. Uh, how, does, how does that work? Yeah, this is something that, that a few researchers, researchers have thought about for a while because antibiotics, we used to think going back 20, 30, 40 years ago, we thought them had, that they'd have only fairly temporary impacts on the gut ecosystem. You'd get this little disruption, then things would settle back in. Um, since we started using DNA-based te te techniques, we realized that's not generally the case, in that you get a pretty massive disruption for a couple weeks, but you can actually have extinction-level events. You know, there was a study published in, in Gut 2019, and Gut is a, a gastroenterology journal. Single course IV antibiotics, nine species went extinct from that, never to return. You know, and it's like, ah, oh, and how many courses of antibiotics did the general person take a year, and what's the impact of that on their ecosystem? So there's certainly thought about ha having to do like fecal banking, stool banking, so you can actually have that way of personally re-inoculating with your own unique bugs that match you and your, your family line, I would argue as well, um, which I think is exciting. But again, that's still a little ways away. People talking about the disappearing microbiota hypothesis, which is the idea that many of our Western diseases that we're seeing so commonly, from autoimmune to the neuro neurodegenerative conditions to obesity and the allergy epidemic are related to loss of ecosystem diversity and loss of key species at, at certain time points that we need to, that we've evolved alongside that we no longer have. When they have sampled ecosystems from um, untouched populations like Peruvian, Amazonian Indians, and some of the hunter-gatherer tribes in Africa, their diversities have just been immense compared to what the typical Westerner has now. So if you come from different ethnicities, um, that can um, 
be quite your bike bioto can be quite um, sort of representative of that background. Is that right? I'd say there's a there's a degree of that, yes, a and I do think there's a certain amount of that. This diet related as well that if people are eating a certain diet because we can take people that um, you know from J who, who grew up in Japan to five years old and put them in America or Australia and you skip forward 15 years their ecosystem is looking pretty typical assuming they've adapted you know the, the American or Australian diet they're looking pretty much on par with the Australian American type ecosystems at that point diet has such a huge impact on things and you can you can starve off species through your diet and you can in your feeding things through your diet so you can really shift ecosystems dramatically and generally the western diets that we have in Canada America the US, Australia are poor <laughs> for feeding the good species that we want well fed and nurtured unlike traditional diets in Japan and Asian, traditional Asian diets or hunter gatherer type diets where their diversity of foodstuffs are massive um, their fiber intake is massive and their, as a consequence, their ecosystem diversity is massive. Jason, is drinking red wine good for your gut flora? No, <laughs> but, but some is okay. And I think there's a general threshold of around three standard drinks or above that you start getting some damage to your gut and um, gut ecosystem. You know, if you stick to one or two standard drinks a couple times a week, that's all good. But I think there's a, a threshold when you go above that point where, um, we can, there's some bacterial metabolites called endotoxins or lipopolysaccharides and we know that people have three, four or five drinks, their system gets flooded with those bacterial bits and that's from both bacteria dying from the alcohol exposure but also the, the gut and the small intestine gets a bit damaged and a bit leaky from the alcohol and that flushes those, those compounds in and that's why people often feel more rubbish and have headaches and more, more inflamed and swollen not themselves because of that endotoxin rush that comes from higher amounts of alcohol ingestion as well. So no, <laughs> a little bit, the, the red, polyphenols are great, red wine in, in the right amount or de-alcoholized red wine works fine or grape juice works just as well, you know, so... What about, what about kombucha? Everyone, you know, kombucha's quite well known now. Yeah. What do you think about that? Um, I think it's a lovely drink, and I think it's good to replace many other things, and I, I drink it frequently too, but I, I think part of the misnomer here is, is that people think they can recolonize their gut with kombucha, so that they might have been able to damage it with antibiotics or other agents and go, oh, it's all right, I can just drink my kombucha and life will be fine, it'll be recolonized. No. Recolonization is not easy. Bar, bar feces or, or breast milk, there's no way of recolonizing the species that we've generally lost. So you mentioned breast milk and feces. What are, I've actually read about the vaginal, when children are born vaginally, um, does that have an impact on your coloni colonization? It does, yes. We, we know that kids who are born via C-section end up having generally quite a different gut ecosystem than those born vaginally. Um, and in fact, and their skin ecosystem is completely different too. And I find this really fascinating. Um, it's that the skin ecosystem of kids born um, via C-section actually comes from hospital staff, not from parents. Yeah, and I think, God, that's fascinating. You want to make sure that they've got good skin bacteria before the hospital staff touches your, your child, if you have the considerations around C-sections. But we certainly know that that process of going through the birth canal and being seeded with vaginal flora, it certainly paves the way for a, a, a healthier ecosystem later on. We know that. And it's not like it's, a healthy vaginal ecosystem or microbiota of the vagina is very much lactobacillus dominated. And those same species that we find in the vagina, we don't generally find in the gut in great amounts. But it's something about how that, the, that initial inoculation tends to pave the way for a healthier ecosystem to develop afterwards that we don't get. But it's a bit more complicated too because via the C-section process, there's an antibiotic course administered right at at the time of the C-section, and there's often breastfeeding difficulties too that come alongside the C-section. So that can confound the data a wee bit too, in that the kids are getting another insult of antibiotic right at that, that time of um, you know, initial seeding, um, plus they may not be getting that, that reinforcement through breast milk too, because you know, breast milk is pretty amazing in that you can get you know, a couple hundred different species within breast milk of bacteria. Um, plus special oligosaccharides called human milk oligosaccharides, a so special fertilizer for the good bugs. And it's actually, each mom produces a different sort of um, sugar in their, their, their breast milk to feed their own family line of like bifidobacteria. It's actually pretty brilliant. And when we, again, miss that up, there are repercussions. Um, 
in terms of microbiome development for the kids who are formula fed versus breastfed, which makes sense when we understand that breast milk isn't just protein and carbs and, and fat, it's actually, yeah, it's got that <laughs> and vitamins and minerals, but it's like hundreds of different species of bacteria plus all these um, oligosaccharides which work as fertilizer for the beneficial bacteria as well. Uh, look at the cure, it's COVID-19, am I going Yeah, I'll be very curious. I would. Yeah, right, okay. <laughs> Thank you. No, Thank you. I've just had a very elderly mum, 94 years, and she's had lots of gut inflammation and things, and we talked about her gut, and perhaps the gut bacteria wasn't, um, wasn't working. It's probably. Well, that was so interesting. Uh, I think we've got a much better understanding of how important the gut microbiome is, uh, thanks to Dr. Jason Horolak. And um, if you want to know more about really interesting stuff, hit that subscribe button and we'll see you next time.